everyone. I think we're going to get started. Almost on time. Thank you for coming to this Friday afternoon festivity well, we, where we plan to celebrate some of our great teaching. But before we do that, I would like to make sure everybody knows and appreciates the support we get from George and Margaret McMurtry right down here. Who have been with this college for a while still have not been associated with it probably as long as George has because he was really here at the beginning and worked with Jim Thomas and others to figure out what kind of curriculum a, a college like this should have. And he's been looking over us for all those years and contributing in this particular way of you know helping us to celebrate the really excellent teaching that we, we, we enjoy in this college. And so, once again, thanks for all you do. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to turn to the man of the hour. Oh, I'm sorry. You did that couple more times out there. Oh, we're sisters. We are talking about that. Yes. <laughs> uh, Professor Hill, who uh, is known by all of us, beloved by many of us. <laughs> as many of us as I know, anyway. Um, and was was selected this year as the, the recipient of the uh, McMurtry Award. And as a result, we've asked him to give this lecture to show us some of his prowess and uh, reflect on his strategies. So, with that, oh, take it away, Professor. I, I guess no good deed goes on fun. <laughs> Here at IST, we have a whole lot of scope, right? What I'm going to do is not talk about any of the stuff that's inside substance. Instead, what I'm going to do is talk about the things that I do that maybe are stuff you might want to pick up. The format that I've chosen to use is exactly the same as the format that I use in class. So the entire presentation is an object lesson. Okay? But those of you who've had a class with me, and there are there are a few, right? There are a few. Which are a pleasant few, even if it's you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> pleasant few, right? Well, I could have said that for either of you. <laughs> anyway, it is we understand that we often deal with cultural differences. And I want to start out with, with a slight discussion. Actually, I consider it to be... Oh, hi, Peggy. Oh. <laughs> I like to start all my classes with some form of joke. The reason that I do that, and I do it on purpose, is to entertain myself, no, to, to uh, get the students students' attention. So I want to focus on culture. And I'm reminded of a story that I read a long time ago. I don't have this on, do I? Do I have this on? It's not okay. It is not. Oh. Hello. You told me that you told me there was no feedback. What happened? It is on. Is there feedback? No. Okay, cool. Anyway, so I usually start with a joke. You could turn that down some. Southern Iowa in August. 
And he's all dressed up. He's got fancy shoes and all of this. And of course, it's a beamer, so it falls apart in front of a farmer's house, the lane to a farmer's house. He needs help. His cell phone doesn't work, nothing works. So he walks up to the farmer's home. And the farmer, uh, out, well, and the phone has a porch and steps. And you walk up to there, and there's the screen door. And he knocks on the screen door before the farmer can get there. Before he gets there, the, uh, a pig walks down the hallway for him. And this pig has three legs. He's missing a back leg. And he's unbelievably, or believably, waddling as he goes down. And he's shaking back and forth and all that. And this is the, our um, young professional is laughing at this, right? This is probably the funniest thing. First, he's never seen a pig. Secondly, he's never seen one uh, walking around like that. By the time the farmer gets there, the farmer is a little upset with that. And he says, son, this is a, this is a special pig. Stop, la stop laughing at my pig. What do you mean, a special pig? Just last month, I was out plowing in the back field, and I turned the tractor over on me. Right? And I'm pinned under the, pinned under this, uh, pinned under the tractor. And I'm not going to die yet. My wife's not here. Nobody knows really where I am. Out of nowhere, this pig comes. Starts rooting around, digging, all that, drags him out, saved his life. About that time, the pig fell over. Our young urban professional is <coughs> laughing again at this. And the farmer is, is totally incensed. And he grabs that, slams open that screen door, grabs that guy by the shoulders and says, son, you don't understand. When you have a pig that's that good, you don't eat him all at once. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> cultural clash. <laughs> Uh, apologies to anybody who hasn't been to Southern America. Okay. So what we're going to be talking about is the association that I have observed between time, the concept of time and the execution of things within limits of time, and, and what happens in the college classroom. I'm using the term college classroom here inclusively. That includes uh, the classroom that is the online classroom, all right? Uh, thanks, Jake, for that phrase. That comes directly out of your, out of your. So what are, we, what are we going to talk about? I'm going to give some preliminary comments, right? I'm going to wind this up, right? I'm going to get us schooled up so that we're going to be able to do something. Then I'm going to talk about the way time and learning occur from my perspective, right? I can't tell you what your perspective is. I can't tell you if the techniques and methods that I'm going to be talking about will be effective for you. But what I can tell you is I use them and they seem to be effective. Right. The last thing is uh, conclusions and lessons learned. And now I've got to do a logical break. Right? The logical break is this is what I do with every lecture. That is, I start them by telling them what I'm going to tell them, then I spend time telling them, and then at the end I tell them what I told them. There's no magic in this, right? But it gives them a frame of reference, something that they can hold on to and deal with as you're going through the details. But the real value is that when they see the lessons learned thing, they know they can fold up their stuff and get ready to leave. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. And let's, let's start to it, okay? I don't know about other people who, who've gotten the award, and there are at least two or three in here who have got, received the award before, right? I can't tell you what, was, what worked for them, but for me, I find that the achievement of the award, I didn't do this all by myself. I, I just didn't. I stole, I stood on the shoulders of others. I had to because nobody would be able to see me. I got it. <laughs> okay, which one is which? I failed another time. Thanks for coming. Anyway, so what I'm going to do is, is, is talk about that. Some of the significant enabling contribution. Right? I need, need to do this. Some will be from out of my past. Some will be, let's say, around here. And some will be of others, okay? 
So the first one, do you even know who these people are? Okay. Yeah, those are my parents. Pictures taken at a different time. But there's a reason for that. A lot of things that my mother told me turn out to be untrue. Okay. Right? Joining the team. That's the way it always is. But she did say one thing to me, and I, it, I held on to it. She said, no learning ever goes on you. That's a pretty good lesson to have. The guy on the right, that's my father, like you couldn't tell, right? <laughs> right? And, and he said, he had a lot of things. He was actually somewhat of a folk philosopher in the vein of Yogi Bear, right? And he said, half of your waking life, you're working. You better enjoy it. Right? And those, those words have, have, have done really well in both cases. The next one are around here. You know, i got to thank Mike. Mike is the one... Mike's not here, right? Mike is the misguided one who saw fit to, to, uh, to hire me, which was a risky thing, because I, I had very little background about teaching before I came here, right? Certainly not in a D1 research school. Certainly not, okay? So, but he gave me one instruction. Go see Lisa. <laughs> and Lisa gave me the keys, keys to the toolkit. Okay? If it weren't for their contributions, I don't know what I'd be doing. Right? I don't know what I'd be. And then, then there's you. Do you, remember, do you remember the situation? This is when you, you first were going in to meet our, our 10 month premature granddaughter. Okay. Three o'clock, yeah. ten weeks, I know, right? Yeah. Something. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, and, and she, her contribution was to give me the permission to spend all this time, the encouragement to do the right things, and the, the right inspiration for doing things. Now, she does not like to be the center of any kind of attention. Right? So, everybody look at her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you do, don't do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's enough shoulders to stand on, and I thought that I, ne I needed to share that with them. The framing of it. I, I try in the talks that I give, first of all, I try not to give many talks, but in the talks that I do give, I use a methodology for the slides that is probably unlike that methodology that is used um, <coughs> in the typical in the typical IST classroom. That is specifically, uh, this way of organizing a presentation slide is called assertion evidence. Um, anybody familiar with it? Other than those who've seen me do this before. <laughs> I'm so surprised. I think you aimed me at it. But this is one of those tools. This isn't like what Microsoft uh, PowerPoint gives us. Microsoft PowerPoint whether you follow those templates or not, they give you a hierarchical view of the world. Right? There's points, subpoints, and things like that. It's as though people learn by memorization, which they don't. People learn by asserting something and surrounding it with evidence. Sometimes that assertion is a graph, a chart, a picture, or something like that. Other times, it's textual like this. This method of, you, of organizing slides for the classroom is demonstrably superior to what Microsoft uh, I don't know, uses to dumb down the world. Okay. I can say that I've met Bill Gates. But, okay. <laughs> but let's now return to the content of this. Put it there, I'm going to spill it. I'd rather spill over here. Okay. What I try to do every time is to present students with things that I believe lead to their better learning. That's what this is about. This, this job, this career, for me, is not about teaching. Surprising, right? We call these people teachers or instructors. Educator, you know, we painted all different kinds of stuff. 
But that's not what it's about. It's about what the students learn. It's not about what we teach. It's about absorption, reception, not transmission. Okay. So what do we have? I'll give you an example. First example came to me 15 years ago, long before I arrived here. I was reading a book about, like I always do, reading a book about uh, the Korean War. Right? And I was struck by a phrase that was just a, a single paragraph that was talking about the 1st Marine Regiment's retreat from Chosin Reservoir. All right, let me just put this in perspective. A good day got as warm as minus 10 Fahrenheit. This is a bad place to be, okay? Very bad place to be. And the colonel leading the regiment is walking down and walking away from the place, and he comes upon a young, uh, young private who is sitting beside the road. He's obviously cold, <coughs> he's shaking, and he's having trouble um, assembling something. Assembling actually a, a grenade launcher onto his right foot. He can't do it. Right? He just is unable to do it. So the commanding officer stops, goes to the young man, I'm not, I'm going to use you, goes, goes to the young man and says, I hear, see you're having trouble. Said, yeah, yes sir, he said. You know, I'm having trouble. And he says, well, you know, eventually you could put that thing on that way, but if I were you, I'd do it this way. And he took the rifle from him, assembled it, showed it to him, took it apart, gave it back to him, and said, now you put it together. He put it together and walked away. Now, that commanding officer could have done a lot of things. He could have ignored him, right? We'll go on our way. He could have chewed him out for being incompetent. He could have assembled it and given it back to him that way and said, go on your way. He could have done any number of things. That's not what he did. What he did was showed him how to do it his way. And that's what I do. I don't tell people what the right thing to do is. Oh, you know, if you write this loop in C++ in this way, it'll terminate properly. I don't do that. Right? What I would do in that situation is say, hmm, interesting solution, might not work. Why don't you try it this way? I like doing it this way and it seems to work for me. So it's all personal. Oh, by the way, as an instructor, that exposes me to getting it wrong, right? We don't typically, I don't typically know everything within the scope of a course, so there's a good chance somebody will come to me with a C++ program that I can't completely solve right in the beginning. But I do my best, right? Show them how to go about it. Show them a way that works. That's how I do things. Then I use what works best for me. So. You're going to see stuff. That's a good word, a great word, right? It's a noun, it's a verb, it's violent, it's, it's whatever it is, right? But it's stuff that you're going to say, that will never work for me. Okay. Right. But I think that if one of you picks up one thing out of this, it'll, it'll have been successful. Mm -hmm. The other thing is when you're done, you assess, assess what happened. I've often wondered. What happened to that young prime? Right. Often wondered about. What, where is he? How was his life significantly changed? I, I thought it was. You can do it this way. Okay. So now let's look at the main assertion for the, for this this talk. The main assertion is that it's time is important and it affects our students' learning. That almost sounds like an accident, to me, right? But let's see if we can put some meat on it to give it substance a little bit better than simply being, being an accident. That is, we've probably all, certainly I have observed the phenomenon that goes along the lines of the attention span of our students is less than it was when we were in school. I don't think any, is anybody, except for those of you that are still here, right? You know what we do with, is that yours? Who's phone? 
the other thing I do in class when I hear a phone call, Jake, is, is you got to buy a round of drinks for everybody. What are you My apologies. That's okay. Hey, another object lesson. Thanks for doing that on me at the end of the day. So, we, we know that. We are not going to change their attention span, are we? We'd like to. That's a, maybe a societal problem, right? We're not going to be able to do that. So we are subject to that, right? We have to adjust to that. How many of you, when you were in school, it was, realized that it was not uncommon to have an hour-long lecture from from an instructor. Certainly I do, right? They fall apart after 15 minutes, right? That's why I could get away with doing this. Right? You, on the other hand, <laughs> experience that. Okay, so an observed phenomenon. Second thing is, from an economic perspective, time is a constraint, right? Pretty, pretty straightforward constraint, but it's different than any of the other constraints. It is entirely different than in, in at least one regard. That is, you can't get it back. After it's gone, it's gone. Those of you who had project management, you guys did? Yes, we did. Yeah, right. Have you heard that before? A little bit. Yeah, yeah a little bit. One time. Right? You can't get it. Can anybody shift time? Right? This is not back to the future. And the other thing is, and this I truly believe is an axiom, that is, uh, there's a lot of tools out there, right? Well, these are the tools that, that, that seem to be effective. For me. Before we get into all this stuff, I think it's important that we understand the concept of time. It's more than just economic in, in, in a sense. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, about how the traditional approach would look at the concept of time. Right? And the traditional approach actually does something that we cherish in IST. That is, the traditional approach would decompose it. Right? Sorry, this is not Beethoven decomposition. Right? That's what he's doing now. Right? Sorry. Sorry. This is okay. Beethoven. Is that, is that, am I missing this again? Right? So, anyway, decomposition. It's fundamental to many of the things we do, isn't it? Why not teach using decomposition as a, as a fundamental approach? So that's what I did with this. I said, well, I want to talk about measurement, the evolving concept I want to talk about a little bit, and I want to talk about also something that is truly relevant to IST that comes from an entirely different field. Right? So what do we have? First thing about this stuff, I'm going to assert this, and I'm not even going to try to prove it. I think we can all agree that time is important. If it wasn't, we wouldn't all be looking at clocks all the time. We wouldn't all worry about schedules. Our cars would run. A whole bunch of things would happen if time wasn't important for them. Right? So let's just set that aside for But what I do want to talk about is devices for measuring time. They're pretty important. right? And I want to talk a little bit about standardization of, of time because it's a cool example. Okay. So let's look. And many of these we know. We know, probably know this is a typical ship's clock. You probably know this. That's a tower clock. Have any of you seen this one? Have you been to Bristol in England? Have you? Have you seen it? Good. Cool. This is a clock that's operated by the phases of time. Okay. I know of no other. Right. Um, this one you probably know. A sundial. You probably know what this is. I don't know. You put three minutes worth of sand in there and you overcook your egg, right? This, uh, probably many of you have seen it. If you've been in Vancouver in Steamtown, you've seen this one. This is a steam driven clock. And the public steam service is actually come through there. And, and there's always a goofy example on like puns. Sorry. Another pun. Sorry. Okay. One of these devices is completely different operationally from the other. And I don't, the tie, I suppose, is, but that's not the one I mean. This is the one that I mean. Okay. This one 
reports noon, or any other time, reports noon to be the point at which, the time at which the sun is at its, whatever the top is, apogee? Thank you, thank you. Who did that? Cool, thanks. Yeah, you, you had a C minus, you could work your way down from it. Okay. So, depending on what longitude you're on, noon is a different time. That's pretty significant. But we don't have that here, right? Here we have time zones. Right? But why do we have time zones? How did, what happened to cause that, cause that to occur? Right? There's a real problem solved by the railroad industry. Not the government, not some, some arbitrary person, not some brilliant person. The entire industry did. Why did they do that? In the 1870s, throughout the 1870s, there was an average of 1,800 train wrecks every year. That's a big number. That's uh, between five and six a day, right? 300 of those, one a day, were head on. No wonder that the railroad industry had the highest fatality rate among employees at the time. This is a problem. It's a problem not only for the railroad industry, but for the expansion of the, of the economy of the U.S. Right? Because most of them are hauling freight of some sort. Right? Passenger traffic has never been really a big deal for, for And then they started looking at things. Why is this happening? Why are we having so many accidents? And they investigated the schedules, the dispatcher's schedules. When can I send this? Right? When can I send this train? And they discovered that all the schedules were based on solar time at the source and destination cities. Imagine how complicated that's going to be. Oklahoma City was seven minutes wide. Okay? You don't understand how difficult this is? So that industry came up with the idea of of actually, the original idea was to divide the U.S. with we didn't have we didn't have uh, uh, Hawaii and Alaska at the time into five pieces. They settled on four, and we have four time zones today. Kind of an interesting thing. So the problem deaths and crash trains the problem was solved by something entirely unexpected. The use of the timekeeping instrument and and the lack of uh, and, and position on in longitude. We run in, folks. We run into this sort of thing in IST all the time. The solution isn't where we start looking. It's not obvious. What are we going to do about that? Okay. So and, and just to find, put a cap on it. Thirty-five years later, almost thirty-five years later, the uh, the uh, U.S. federal government adopted. My grandparents talked about railroad time to, until their death. Right? Pretty interesting thing. But you've got to understand this stuff in order to think, start thinking about it. And of course, the concept has, has uh, the concept of time has morphed. Right? It's, it's changed. Right? For example, the F2 atomic clock at NIST uses a fountain of cesium, cesium atoms, whatever that means. Right? to determine the length of a second within, or yeah, measure the length of a second with an error rate of less than plus, of plus or minus one second every 300 million years. Close enough. Right? Close enough. Relativity also gets into this. I love it when I can, when I can nearly quote I, Einstein. Einstein is the one to whom it's attributed uh, relative time, right? And he explained it in an open audience as imagine how long an hour is spent, I'm going to paraphrase, with your in-laws compared to an hour spent with your wife, right? <clears throat> so an hour, that concept of an hour is, is, uh, is morphing 
as we're, we're sitting under. And even today, the tiny fractions of a second as a result of, of electronic transmissions over wire or light are extreme factors in determining where to locate your major data, data center. You want your data center to be on top of one of the internet switches to minimize the physical distance because of the amount of time that it would take to transmit. Pretty strange. You wouldn't think that. Well, why do we care about milliseconds? So that you can get your trade on the market before everybody else. So time does this to us. But how, does that, how do we present this in class? The way, one of the ways in class is, is the parable of the watchmaker. How many of you are familiar with the parable of the watchmaker? Cool. Also, I can entirely lie about this and nobody would know it. I don't think I will. Imagine, imagine using a parable about something like a mechanical watch to explain a difficult principle in, in ISD. Okay? So let, let's see how this so see how this flows through, right? Imagine there are, are two uh, well-known, I guess, Swiss makers of mechanical watches. All those, yeah, that's what Switzerland does. They do, do those things. And one of them is named Tempus and the other Aura. And I didn't make those names up, but they're pretty fun. Right? But what are we gonna what are we gonna do? We're gonna talk about how this parable associates with the principles of coupling and decomposition, which are fundamental elements of design for applications. Fundamental. You can't escape them. Well, yeah, sure. You can escape them by not recognizing them, by not doing them. And, and uh, see, see where that takes you. Right? And you're, you're in the realm of, the realm of whatever. Well, anyway, Tempus was a very unfortunate man. He ran his business, right? But he ever, the longer he ran it, the poorer he got. Until he got to the point where he had to sell his business, right? So it's not really good. Or, on the other hand, his business prospered. But why is that? What, what, what causes that? Well, it turns out that Tempest builds his watches monolithically. That is, every part, no part is separated from any other part. So when things happen, like he's partway through assembling a watch, and he gets a telephone call, when he sets it down, it falls apart. Right? It's, it's so, so tightly coupled, believe it or not, so tightly coupled that he can't isolate what the causes of problems are. When somebody says, I need my watch fixed, he has to disassemble the entire thing in order to be able to fix it. Pretty bad. <coughs> or, on the other hand, builds these little stable sub-assemblies of, let's say, 10 parts. He assembles those sub-assemblies into, let's say, um, ten of those little sub-assemblies into, <coughs> let's say, ten major sub-assemblies and ten of them into the final line. So that while he's building them or while he's repairing them, he's only looking at a tiny piece of things. And oh, by the way, if, there's a, if there is some major difficulty with his design, <coughs> he only typically has to alter, alter one sub-assembly, not the entire thing. His, if you want to think of it as his having decomposed the mechanical watch into stable sub-assemblies is, is the thing that enables his, his profitability. It's kind of a cool idea. So we've used the mechanical watch. Anybody wearing one? Anybody have one? Right, okay. Right. Which we don't see often, right? So you're Patek Philippe, right? Okay. <laughs> An interesting idea. This, this sort of parable and explanation drives home 
the concept of modularity in systems development. Pretty cool. I don't know about this guy. It's not clear to me he did, I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> okay. But so far, I've been really vague and not effective in explaining how this is associated, how time is associated with, with, uh, with learning. So let's walk through a couple of the tools that are directly applicable to what I have seen to be fairly, how uh, fairly, uh, I guess, successful. Right? Well, first of all, I decompose the process of conducting a course. Right? Decompose it. And I use time to do the decomposition. That is, I, what goes on before the planning stuff, what goes on during while the course is being delivered, and what goes on afterwards. By the way, for me, three is a magic number. Okay? I can remember lists with three elements. Four or more, the results are, are unpredictable. Okay. So it works for me. I hope that, that you're able to handle, let's say, greater decomposition. But I also treat every single course as an instructor. I teach it like it's a project because that's what it is, right? It's, it satisfies the definition. It has a definite beginning, well, sort of. And the, and, and the beginning is, where is Kathy? Uh, she goes, there you are. When I hear from you what I'm going to be teaching, right? And it ends when I put the grades in and maybe a couple of days later because there's always complaints. So. So it's got a definite beginning and ending, and I know what's got to go on between the beginning and ending. So I take the entire process and divide it into three parts, planning, delivery, and course analysis. Folks, there's no magic, magic in it. Okay? So what do I do? In preparation for a course, my planning took place a while ago. Put all of it here. I don't know how many of you who are instructors were actually educated as teachers. I think I only know one. Is that right? Is 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 uh, teaching program? Peggy, thanks. That's the other thing that happens, folks. Not logical break. I always forget words. Okay, and it, and it, and as I age gracefully, thank you. As I age. It is more frequent that I forget words. So I have an explanation for that. And as time goes by, we learn more and more stuff. Right? Right? The thing is that the, the accessing algorithm doesn't scale up. Right? So my access time, so you don't get that. Do you? All right, let's go back. Enough to, enough to 10. Right? Enough of the 10. So where did I go? I went to Schreier. The, the, not the Honors College, to the Learning Institute, okay? And I went there and they said, oh, here's how you go about this. You do this, you do this, you do that, do that. And I did the same thing that I'm asking you to do. Pick the stuff that's going to work and throw the other stuff away, right? So I did that. I closed three or four courses. Surprisingly, I remembered things from it. The second thing is I base it on assessments from previous semesters. If I've taught it before, what happened? You know, my former students are required, not required, they can either do the work or not do the work, but the, the syllabus requires them to, to give me an assessment in greater depth in some ways than the SRT used to. So I get that, and, and guidance from others, which is time for another, eh, yeah, it's time for another break, another logical break. Today we use the um, peer assessments as an observer going in and watching you. All right, you're conducting a course. I go in there and I say, "Yeah, he's doing well." Four people are sleeping. I don't know. That's a good number, <laughs> right. or or whatever it is. The learning is expected to be accumulated by the speak by the teacher. Hill says that's backwards. That's backwards, at least in my case. I learn more 
from what people are using as methods and techniques in the classes that I observe than they ever got from me. Right? So, so the challenge is to reverse that process. Not enough of the editorial company. Right? So that's how you do it. Use that as a learning thing and, and get guidance from it. Second thing is, I put together a strategy for a book. Right? Um, sometimes I do it formally, sometimes I do it mentally. I do it mentally so that I can forget parts of it. Right? No, actually, I start with what do, when they leave, what do I want them to know? Right? Seems trite. What do I want them to know? Then I said, what are some of the activities that they should do to be able to demonstrate that they have achieved the learning objectives? Then I decompose it further into what collateral do I have to prepare? Right? All those lecture materials and cases and all that stuff, you have to put all that together. And oh, by the way, I look at, if I've done it before, I look at, at the assessments, just assessments from prior semester. So this is a course. Right? And then there's some tactics, one of which is maybe the only thing I invented. Okay, so I'm going to spend a lot of time on that so you're really impressed. Everything else that's in here I stole from somebody else without attribution. So I, I guess I violated some form of intellectual property. Every single session for every course I teach has something that looks like this. Okay? What this is, is a, an instructor plan that is also, that, that contains the syllabus. The stuff, you want to think of it from, from do this week to the left, is what goes into the syllabus modulo, some things that I... I rip out because I don't want them to know what pun I'm going to tell them that day or whatever, right? And the stuff that's over here is all about that collateral, right? I have a, a series of modules, right? Put them in a garbage can, label each speech in the garbage can. So I have 281, which is music. Wow. Today, before this started, we played Pink Floyd. Does anybody know what the music was except Frida? Because we've already talked about it. Time. What else would it be? Okay. Right. Everyone, and by the way, it's designed to end, and you did a really good job with that, designed to end what I want the class to begin, and I stole that from Ed. Okay. It's a really cool thing, right? You go, and, and believe it or not, I, you, know, you look at their faces, at least three quarters of them are actually looking at Kate Smith's singing God Bless America, whatever I've got up there, right? And then they know that when the music's done, I say, welcome everybody, get your head up here. Let's start, start thinking about like that. Okay? So anyway, I've got all this, this stuff, right? We've got, so I have these four files. By the way, this came out of... Um, IST-110S, and will be used on, on uh, November 18th. Okay, they don't know that yet, right? But, but it have all this collateral stuff that are put together. These things over here are, have I done, are they ready to go in status? The second thing is, have I put it in the right place in Angel? All of the materials for all of my courses are on Angel. And it's all there before the course begins. That's an important thing, right? A very important thing. The logical break is if you do it that way, and aren't we asking our students to act that way with every class, right? If we do that, we can spend time doing the support of the teaching that occurs while the course is going on. And logical break. So we have all this stuff on here. This is a, this particular one, as I said, is for a freshman course. So they hear music of my selection, which is the highlight of the day. Okay. Um, what was it today? It was Led Zeppelin. Uh, oh, Stairway, of course. Right? Stairway. Right? 
This is a placeholder that I want to hold off talking about until I get down a little farther. Okay? I tell a pun. Those of you that have had me know I try to start with some sort of joke. I figured, freshman, I better keep it simple. <laughs> Let's do this with a pun. And teach them the etiquette of groaning. <laughs> which which they do. Then I give a mini lesson. Again, freshman course, this mini lesson, one or two slides, and it says something unrelated to the direct topic of the day. How do you go about, about summarizing something? That's what this is. How many times have you, I don't want to, rhetorical question. Please summarize X, Y, Z, whatever, right? And they take 20 minutes to summarize, right? Uh, it's not a summary. Okay. Then I have to use what's called a word wall. A word wall, and I think I got this from you, is that right? <coughs> <coughs> it came from somebody else yet, but I've probably told you. Oh, okay. Oh, so there's a chain of evidence. Gotcha. Okay. You're not willing to take the blame credit. I got. I got. I got. Okay. What What we do is every session in in this one. At the end of the session, we do a session assessment. We, the students, are asked to do a session assessment with three questions. First question, what's today's password? I do that so I know whether they were actually in the room because they're right around the wall. Okay? Can that be spoofed? You bet. Right? But that's what I do. It's also a pseudo measure of attendance, right? Then I ask, what's the most interesting thing you learned today? And the second question, what's the most muddy thing? The thing that I did the worst at explaining as far as you're concerned. And what do I do with that? I give the problem to the learning assistant, and I say, make a word wall. A word wall is one of those devices, you all, we've all seen them. It's a uh, series of words, the size of which is pro proportionate to frequency. Right? So if, if, if uh, the word seminar is used most frequently in the responses <coughs> by students, it becomes the largest one on the page. Guess what I do? When the next class begins, I draw a link to the previous class by saying stuff about time. Right? And I go through two or three of them depending on how many questions there are and, and uh, how important the subject is and, and things like that. So what have I done? I've drawn a link to the previous session and I've killed uh, what at least was the most popular confusion. <laughs> I guess that's the way to do it. So, and that's what this pass, password is all about. You know, you know if you're going to have stairway to heaven, you need stairway as the password. Mm -hmm. Then I get into the meat of the thing. In this case, this is a section of one of, one of the units, which is about developing solutions. This is the phase having to do with defining requirements. So that's what this is. Oh, and by the way, now that, now that I got all this stuff ready, right, I take this stuff from there to the left, pull it out there, put it into the syllabus, and throw out the stuff that's not actually relevant to having it. So, so there's a complete agreement between the plan that I put together and the syllabus that the course is operating. How many of us? have gone into a class and prepared for, for stuff that wasn't exactly what we told them on the syllabus. Right? Right? So that's what this is about. This is the only thing I can claim to have invented from the whole class. Everything else I borrowed without, without permission. So now in looking at, so that, that was all about planning. Right? Let's go into the next phase which is about delivery. Okay, this is what goes on in those, uh, if you're doing twice a week, 29 or 30 sessions, or 44 or 45 if it's three weeks, right? So, again, I'll take the very simple approach of dividing this up by time, although there's an inconsistency in here, and if you find it, that's okay. But, so there's stuff I do before and during and between, okay? Again. Chopped it up by time, real simple. Right. What do we do before sessions? I go over that. I go over that. Right? So 
Welcome to our weekend. I also review all the collateral. All that stuff that's on here, I go through that. And I never find error. I never find corrections. I never find updates. Yeah, right. You believe that? And a bridge to something. And I show quality and completeness. During the session, when I'm in the classroom, I follow the recipe. We all know that no real plan ever survives first contact with the enemy. And let's not call students again. <laughs> right? we, we, we know that that's true. Right? But at least you've got something that you can stage to do the recovery plan. Right? You've got a complete plan that you're comfortable with, and if, if some element of it takes longer or shorter or you miss something, <coughs> whatever else, at least you've got a basis on which to build a recovery plan. Between sessions, between sessions, I'm available. And that's another time-related thing. Another time-related thing. Right? So what do I mean by that? Again, I think that as a philosophy, it's not what you got to do, what you do when you have to do it, that sets you apart. Because everybody's doing that. It's what you do when you don't have to do it that sets you apart. Either good or bad. Right? So let's take a look at some of this. Being available, you get some universal questions. Right? When are your office up? The stupidest question I'll read. Right? When are your office up? Don read. Right? Um, Stuff about the course content. You get, you get those all the time. Please help me understand the following. You get those questions a lot. The more you get about them, the more of those you get, I think, the better off you are. Right? And then other universal questions are what are the grades are. I don't like that grade. I thought I did better on exercise two. Question number one than, than was scored. Here's the way I do it. Okay? You want to tell them how we deal with this here? <laughs> this, guy, this guy sort of says, who's missing? Right, somebody else here? Oh, yeah, Chris. <laughs> you, can, you can do this too. <coughs> okay, so what do we do? Well, most of the scoring of stuff in my courses is done by the, by the assistant, learning assistants or, or, uh, or teaching assistants. Teaching assistants are more complex stuff, learning assistants more uh, straightforward things, um, and under, under guidance from them. Right. That is, part of my delegation uh, delegates uh, authority and direction and all of those things. Right. But if a student has a question, I don't like what I got on whatever grade. I, I think you scored me too harshly. You never got that. Never got that. Never. Right. We never get those things. The student comes to me with a question like that. I send them to the person that did the score. So when you come to me and you say, why did I, I needed a 94 on this because I don't know, whatever, right? I send them to the person that did the scoring. Because quite frankly, if the person that did the scoring can't explain it, I got another problem. Right? And then I say to the student, if, if you two can't come to an agreement, both of you come and see me. So the effect of this is a court of appeals, okay? A court of appeals is really cool. And since I've been doing this, I cut down the frequency of having to deal with this by a lot, <laughs> right? So it's kind of an interesting way to do it. And it does not put the instructor in a position of contradicting the person who scored it, which is another thing. That means you're going to get consistency out of the assessment of, of the exercise. So it's been a real effective thing, real effective thing to do. Also, what happens when you're available is you get some very interesting problems. Like the young lady who came into my office and said, uh, I have a, a social disease. Now, what am I going to do with that? The first thing is, not my fault, right? No, I didn't do that. I listened to her problems and tried to commiserate with her. Do I know enough about how to give her guidance? No, I don't. But, but, think about this. 
young lady felt good enough about our relationship that she was able to talk about something that, I guess, doesn't get much more personal, right? That person. Or, or the student, and this story floors me. I had a student that I gave, uh, for some reason, I, and I don't remember the reason, I had to basically read him the riot act because he wasn't doing his work and all of those kinds of things. I did it, so I guess I did it well. Um, he has been back to visit me since graduation two times. Right. And the first time he came back is he said, you know, that straightened me out. That straightened me out. That's kind of a cool thing. The other example I want to talk about is, is, uh, was, was even more interesting. I had a student come in to see me who I had in two previous classes. So I knew him by name, which is for me pretty good. He came in to me and he said, um, I'm going to be away for a medical procedure for a couple of weeks. He said, can, I, uh, uh, can we work out a schedule for doing this stuff, doing the work at a different time than the syllabus book? Sure, we could do that. It happened beforehand. And I said, we can work that out. The next day, I walk back to my office and he's there again. What's this about? Goes in the office, kind of closed the door. Yeah, you can close the door. He said, I lied to you. I lied to you. Okay. I have to go to a detox program. I've got a drug problem. Okay. I've seen him twice since graduation. Okay. The answer was exactly the same. But he felt comfortable enough because I was available, and because, I guess, I'm certainly available, but perhaps because of approachability as a result of my being able to use time in, in that sort of way. I was there. I wasn't someplace else. Right. Those are good stories, folks. Those are good stories. Okay. And, and frankly, if stuff like that doesn't float your boat, maybe you should spend more time doing research. Okay. The other thing is, another thing that happens to me, I don't know how I treat these things, but I get lots of students who don't belong to me. What's with that? What's with that? And, and they come to me and ask me things that have nothing to do with the court. Help me get a job. Help me, help me get into graduate school. Write a reference for me, right? And, or, or just a plain, friendly contact. This is the kind of guidance outside the scope of direct teaching that we can actually do and positively affect people. Make them go from, make them, allow them to make the transition from a backpack to a briefcase. Kind of cool. When the course is over, okay, after all this is over, I do some analysis. I, I absorb all the feedback. Get in the sponge mode, suck it all up, and do something with it. Right? Now, what do I do? Well, I rec first I recognize that with any of these, there are flaws when viewed from the position of pure academic research. We can all find reasons to object to the process and the form and the analysis that's pro provided us. Um, thanks, Ed. Uh, provided us by the SRTEs. There's no reason to uh, to accept it as a basis for academic research. Right? Same thing as from the peer assessments, right? This is, doesn't have the, the strength of process behind academic research. I don't care. Right? I don't care. I'm not looking for fine points. I'm not looking to measure this stuff with a micrometer, because I've got to cut it off with an axe, right? That is specifically the things that academic researchers use for are not highlighted by the process. Why should I worry about it? They're not things I'm going to do. Am I getting through to them? Are the processes I use in the classroom effective? Those are the things I get out of those, those tools. I also, every class I teach, ask for what I call an after-action report. And I ask them, essentially ask them, 
If, if you were in charge, what changes would you make to the court? And if they submit one, they get full credit. If they don't submit it, they get zero. And I tell them and follow the practice of never reading them until after I submitted the credits. Okay? And I tell them that. Right? That happened with you guys? Mm -hmm. Whichever one you want. <laughs> then after absorbing all this stuff, I take some appropriate action, which sometimes is, is to throw it out, sometimes is to accept it, sometimes to do this, whatever, whatever it is. But the whole idea is, is to do experience, for me as an instructor, to do experience-based learning. Every time, without exception, without exception. What do you know about this slide? You weren't paying attention. This is the last slide. <laughs> okay. It's only the first class, John. Huh? It's only the first class. <laughs> well, I told you. We're slow learners. <laughs> you mean your first class ever? <laughs> Okay, so what do we do? This stuff works for me. I can tell you for certain that the students that I now have are benefiting from improvements that were made in previous classes. Absolutely sure. Now, you're asking me how much have they improved? What's the distribution of that improvement? Sorry, I don't care. I care that it's improved. But to get there, I had to learn to be a teacher. I am not a natural teacher. Right? I just I'm not. Right? I, probably nobody is. Maybe Socrates. I don't know. Maybe Socrates. But you go ask him. Right? Find out if you want. And then I usually prepare after which I prepare, and after that I prepare a little bit more. The execution success is a result of the preparation the preparation before the course, before the session, during the course, during the session, and and after previous sessions and after previous courses. The way I use time is to apply what, oh, oh, they're not capitalized, really cool, is to apply the things that I've learned to prepare every time. Every time. I can't tell you the number of weekend hours I was bl I blow, but I don't really care, right? I guess I care. As long as it doesn't impinge on dinner, I'm okay. <laughs> and, and the other thing, and perhaps the, the single biggest thing, is the availability that leads to approachability and, and leads to situations where students are comfortable. Right? This, is, this is my way of doing things. I hope you got something out of this that you could apply in the classroom or or if you're in the classroom to understand what's being done to with about you. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much. Usually, 
but somebody sends me an email, says, I got a really bad score on this, I don't understand, I'm otherwise a good student, and, and I, I uh, reread your, I was in class, I read your notes, I went, I went to the review session, I did this, that, and the other, what could I do different? And the answer is invariably, read the book. Okay? That, that's really how I, how I deal with it. So there's no methodical way of, uh, that I have used to do that. That's a cool idea. I mean, I, I'll think about whether I want to do that. That's how I learn these things. It's not the answer that you get that's enlightening. It's the question. Right? Carly? Um, thanks, John. It's really fantastic to hear about your approach. Um, I'm wondering how you make yourself available to the students. What does that mean? Let me have somebody else answer that. Okay? Read it. <laughs> yeah, you can answer this. Well, you know why you can answer this. Well, yeah, it's the, it's the cup of coffee. Yeah. I mean, when I get here at 6 o'clock in the morning or 6.30 or 7.10, John's already here and has already made a pot of coffee. So, and he doesn't have a problem with when I walk by the door saying good morning or, or it's always a, how are you? And it's sincere. And there's time, five, ten minutes, to have a casual swallow, cup, to a cup. It's always not a problem. Do students come in that early? No. That's <laughs> the earliest student I had is you. Because you know I don't know. When, when did you come in that one day? 7.15? <laughs> yeah. It was great. 7.15. In the summer, that's right, it was in the summer. I don't, I don't get that, by the way. I don't, I don't get that being. You're very important. Yeah, sometimes there are sleepers out on the couch. <laughs> I, I run into that, uh, I would say, three times a month. I run into sleepers. They were okay. waiting all night for you? I doubt that. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's about time. Right? It's about how much time you're willing to do it. Don't we tell our students? that you're capable of doing all this work, but everybody is able to absorb things at a different rate, you pick the grade you want, and you spend the amount of time to get there. But don't we tell them that? Maybe you don't. I do. And all I'm suggesting is the same kind of approach on the instructional side. Ooh, that was fierce. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, well, please have some goodies on your way out because they're there and we have the time. <laughs>